Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the first um, <clears throat> lecture, um, Galileo Commission lecture um, for uh, this year. Uh, I'm still having to um, let some people in uh, with Professor Marilyn Monk, who's the Vice President of the Network and, and a molecular embryologist uh, who's worked in uh, an, an amazing number of fields. Um, and, and she's moved into, as it were, the consciousness area quite recently after asking really sort of fundamental questions that I, like scientists should ask um, <clears throat> about you know, joint de defining your terms, uh, looking at all these different levels, and and um, creating um, a sort of hierarchical, if you like, view, which was first presented to us in 2018 at the annual meeting, and then written up in the summer journal of 2019. And, and so it's it's a real pleasure to give Marilyn this opportunity to talk about her ideas. And, and those of you who know her work, and this is a crucial point to um, bear in mind, um, is that she regards herself as a scientist, a mystic, and a poet. And, and these are complementary ways of knowing. So the, the scientist will see from a particular view, the poet from another view, and the mystic from another view. And I'm sure she will explain some of this, but it's important to, to put that in context um, before um, I hand the uh, roll over to um, Marilyn. So Marilyn, a warm welcome. Thanks very much for being with us this afternoon slash this morning, depending on where you're coming in from. And uh, over to you. Oh, well, thank you, David. And hello, everyone. I'm not going to say much about the scientists poet and mystic, except that I see them as three aspects of truth, objective truth, reproducible by anyone, anywhere, evidence and facts, that's the scientist, subjective truth, um, intuition, imagination, uh, and so on, but that's my poet, and transcendental truth, uh, which is the mystic, so uh, the reason, but I'm actually going to speak from my scientist today, from my materialistic, mechanistic, reductionist scientist, and but I'm going to end up in the mystical realm. And when I started this uh, um, investigation, um, I had no idea where I was going to end up. I rather surprised myself. So a hierarchy of consciousness from atom to cosmos, this is quite a large, undertaking, atom to cosmos. I mean, if I put them in a sort of rough sort of order, atom to cosmos, I'm looking at atoms to molecules, to cells, to tissues, to organs, to flora, plants and trees and things, fauna, animals, they go into communities, the communities go into ecosystems, ecosystems make the planets, the solar system, the galaxy, cosmos, consciousness. So I'm going to confess at the outset that my only experience is in these early, um, these early stages of this hierarchy. By hierarchy, I don't mean going anywhere to a better place or anything like that. I, I don't know if hierarchy is the right sort of word, but these are my areas of actual hands-on experience. So I have an experiential knowing of these areas. These areas down here, the ecosystem, planet, solar system, galaxies and cosmos, no experience at all. So I've got knowing in this area, but in these areas, I'm borrowing from other people's knowledge, looking up Wikipedia, etc. My experience with atoms was actually the introduction of using radioisotopes of atoms. These are radioactive versions of atoms in substrates in enzyme reactions. And it's worth mentioning that because that was quite a, um, a um, a breakthrough in molecular biology, because until this, I started doing this in the 70s, molecular biology required thousands of cells. And uh, as I just shifted to working in 
development of embryos. I was shifted by the Medical Research Council. And I had to look at one cell to two cells to four cells to eight cells, plus the problem that I really couldn't kill a mouse <laughs> to get an embryo. Um, Anne McLaren, who is my new uh, director at that time, said, don't worry, Marilyn, you just work on the techniques and make them ultra sensitive, which I did. And so this was a bit of a technical breakthrough from that time in the 70s. We had single cell analysis of enzyme activity of genes and gene mutation and gene expression and gene modification. So I'm well known for my incredibly sensitive single cell, single gene techniques. Molecules, I have an experience in terms of from 1959 for about 12 years, um, the structure of DNA was discovered by Rosalind Franklin um, uh, in 1953. So in the 50s, there was a lot of interest in DNA itself. So initially, my research started with DNA replication, isolating the genes involved with initiation and elongation of DNA, recombination of DNA molecules, repair of DNA following radiation and so on. There's this black thing in the middle of my screen here. Um, and then in 1984, uh, we published one of the first papers showing the me molecular mechanisms of epigenetics. I learned about epigenetics in the 60s from Moddington when I was working in Edinburgh, but we didn't have any mechanisms. And we showed in uh, 84, it was, that, that methylation of one of the bases of the DNA was involved in gene silencing. So that was beginning of in my interest in epigenetics. And in terms of molecules, enzymes, obviously, I was always assaying a number of enzymes during development in order to work on the way genes were turned on and off in different tissues in a developing embryo or fetus. My experience with cells is in cell signaling, the environment signaling the cell and telling it what to do, and cell to cell signaling, cells talking to each other in order to do the same thing. And with tissues, obviously I was working on the differentiation of the different tissues in the development, the formation of the, of the placenta and then the yolk sac and then what's called the germ layers of the fetus giving rise to all the different layers uh, and shaping up of the fetus. Um, and with organs, I was mainly involved in reproduction. So very familiar with ovary and testis and differentiation of germ cells and mechanisms of deprogramming to totipotency to tabula rasa in stem cells and that sort of thing. So that's where my, my experience lies. In these areas, I'm, I'm actually looking at other people's experiences. And in terms of my experience in consciousness, it was a nil. <laughs> I was never, uh, certainly never involved in academic consciousness studies. And I became interested in consciousness at the same time as the Galileo Commission was set up, which was how many years ago, David? Uh, four. Four years ago. When we set up the Galileo Commission, it was consciousness this and consciousness that, and everything was about consciousness, and, but I didn't know anything, and I'm thinking, what's that? And now this particular endeavor, looking at consciousness from atom to cosmos, was set in motion by the Max Planck statement that we tend to put in front of all our conferences and talks. CSMN's always using this statement from Max Planck, who was a Nobel Prize winning German physicist and considered the, fa the father of quantum theory. And this statement that we're always making is, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. And I immediately think, what? Matter derivative of consciousness, what does this mean? He said, we cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, we regard as, everything we regard as, as existing postulates consciousness. So I thought, what does this mean? And, I, and he also said, all matter originates only, and I can't see this because there's pictures of people in front of it, a virtue of a force which brings a particle and, and in, of an atom together. And then he compares it with a solar system. And then he talks about this force, behind this force, consciousness, intelligent mind. I don't like the use of mind. It's very, makes me think of humans and brains and things. But he's saying that consciousness is somehow holding the, the atom and solar system together. And, and I was fascinated with this. So what I'm going to talk about today 
is this sentence, I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. What can this mean? So first of all, we have to think, so first of all, we'll think what is matter, then I'll think about what is consciousness, and then I'll try to put them together. Now, matter is everything. It's everything. I wish this black line would go away. Maybe I can put it up there. Ah, put it up there. Oh, and I can turn that one off. That's it. So what's matter? Now, matter is from atom to cosmos. Matter is the stuff spewed out by the Big Bang 14 billion years ago. And But I'm only going to talk about matter on our planet Earth. Um, so I keep getting these things coming across. So sorry about that. So matter is obviously on Earth. It's all life, fauna and flora all the animals and all the plants, and it's all the non-life as well. It's the sand and the stones and the rocks and the mountains and the oceans and the river and the lakes. All of that is matter. And just looking at fauna and flora, uh, in other words, a tree of life, not non-life, just life. I don't know if I can make a tree of life. I'd like to try. I'd have to be a geologist. But in the tree of life, since Aristotle, uh, diagrams of the tree of life all tend to put man at the top as if we're just the pinnacle of the whole lot. And um, I, I would really question that. Now, at the bottom of the tree, in this tree, you can see all the animals. You can see jellyfish and a lovely octopus and some worms and insects and elephants and things. And it tends to show elephants coming off there. There's a rhinoceros and a whale and a bear and humans at the top here. Um, but you'll also note that the origin of all life is just one point down here. Now, the, our Earth, planet Earth, has existed for about four billion years. And about, I don't know how many, maybe a half a billion or a billion years uh, after our planet was formed, our solar system was formed, life happened. And life was the happening of a molecule DNA. And so life has happened only once in four billion years. So it's not a very common uh, phenomenon. And the, the reason it happened with the formation of DNA is that DNA can copy itself. I mean, in a way, the major definition of life is that it propagates, it copies itself. And of course, what we know about DNA is it's a wonderful molecule made up of two a helices, a helix of two strands. And when the strands unwind, and I did a lot of work on this in the, in the 60s, um, the, uh, the old strands, the blue one, when the strand unwinds, we get these new strands made. For us, from one double-stranded helix of DNA, we get two, and they can unwind, and we get four. So the fact that DNA can do this, that the two strands of the parental double helix can unwind, and each can make a new daughter strand, with base pairing rules. The base pairing rules, we've got four bases, A for adenine, C for cytosine, G for guanine, and T for thymine. Those are four bases and they have got the information, the arrangement of those bases are the information that is taken out into the cytoplasm of the cell to specify all the different proteins that make a particular cell. I mean, there are four different bases and in groups of three, they specify an amino acid. And they're obviously, you've got 64, if you do the mathematics, you've got 64 ways that you can arrange four bases in group of three. So this can potentially make 60 amino acids. In fact, there are only 20, which is quite good because that redundancy makes the whole system a little bit more stable in terms of mutation. So DNA happened once here. So all these creatures have come from DNA. And in fact, we have most, humans have 20,000 genes and most of them are in common with all plants and animals. 98.8%, we've got 99.9% .9 in common with each other, 98.8% .8 in common uh, with a chimp, 90% with a pig, 98% in common with a rat, 60% in common with a banana. So in general, over 50% of our genes of, of genes are shared with all animals and plants in the tree of life. Now, the way all these creatures have evolved um, is due to two, two ways, random mutation and selection. That's quite rare. A random mutation could be anything, but if it happened to change a gene into a form that it made a protein that was more suitable 
to help that animal adapt to its environment, then that would make that animal breed more and it would be, and, and in that way we get this variation and also we have um, adaptation environmental programming of genes uh, with a change in environment the, the the genes that cell detects those changes and the genes are differently programmed to make the uh, to make the, the variation in all these different different animals um, So, as I said, most since Aristotle, most people put uh, show this hierarchy of increasing complexity with humans on top, because he thinks that humans are absolutely dominant because of some sort of higher brain intelligence. Darwin never thought that. Darwin thought there was no superior animal in evolution, and by the way, he never thought. He never thought about survival of the fittest, like it was some sort of fight between different species in order to survive. In fact, survival of the fittest means fittest to the environment. The variation with mutation, rare mutation and epigenetic adaptation, uh, if that makes an animal more adapted to its environment, then that animal breeds more. And so the major variation is due to epigenetics and adaptation. So, in, but what the tree of life has no progress, it has no purpose, it is not going anywhere. In fact, creation equals extinction. For as many different forms that evolve over the four billion years, the same numbers have gone extinct. So it's sort of creation, extinction, creation, extinction. Today, there's about 8.7 million species on average, in the billions of years that things can be followed, um, well, I'm not sure how long they can be followed, but a species might last on average about 10 million years. So the whole system works on turnover. It's not going anywhere, it's turnover. And I like to think of that as a play. I like to think of that as a leela, that things come and things go, it's a, it's a, it's a turnover. And so is the, the mechanisms the mark and after him, Darwin always thought the turnover was the inheritance of acquired characteristics. I mean, Darwin's finches on the different islands of the Galapagos have different beaks because on the different islands, there were different sort of nuts they had to crack. And the fact that they had the different beaks wasn't mutation and selection. It was just random variation. Uh, it was not random. It was a variation due to epigenetic modification. So we can think of the genes in terms of our computer language as the hardware and the programming of the genes as a software. And it's the programming by epigenetics turning genes up and down and on and off, which is the most important uh, mechanism of adaptation to environment. Now, I have lost my arrow at the bottom. There it is. So, but nowadays, uh, and, and I was just showing that this is another view of, um, uh, 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 of the tree of life where they've put humans down the bottom here, along with the monkeys, the primates down here. So that's just deliberately saying they're not the top. And in fact, nowadays, when we look at the origin of the different genera, like the monotremes and the marsupials in Australia and, uh, and the, the time, the nodes where they separated from other different genera, which are then divided into the different species. One can arrange these in terms of variations in the morphology of the animal. Uh, but nowadays with whole genome sequencing, uh, one can look, uh, see very clearly the ancestry of all these different um, uh, vertebrates here. They're mostly vertebrates I can't see because there's the, um, the photos on the right. So down here we have primates, we're primates, and if you want to know here, I mean, as I said, we have 90% of our genes in common with a rat, and that's where we dive our, our, our lineage diverged from the rat, but we still have 90% genes in common. And if you look at primates here, then you can see the divergence here with 90% of our genes in common with a cat. So it's not about the genes, but the programming of genes that make all these animals look very different. But as Darwin always said, we don't consider 
that evolution is going in any particular, has any purpose or direction. It's turnover. He, Darwin could never say that any, any living animal was superior to any other. And I agree with that. But I mean, people tend to place things to try to make humans look superior in this sort of looking at common ancestors of human and cat of human and cat with duck and lizard, etc. They put human here, but you could easily twist on this node and put humans over here next to a frog. Or in this case, you make it, they make it look, these are all primates, different species of primates. And if you put humans here, we look like we're special, but in terms of the time since we diverged, uh, when you add in the side bits and things, we could easily uh, swivel on X and put humans over here. So we tend to, to try to think that humans are superior or, or some sort of pinnacle in evolution when we're not, in my opinion, an opinion of Darwin. Now I've talked about, that's all the matter we're concerned with at the moment. So what about consciousness now? And then I'll put consciousness and matter together. What do we mean by consciousness? There's so many definitions, so many viewpoints, the way people use the term consciousness. And these different viewpoints depend on the background of the scholar. So understandably, perhaps the quantum physicist, the philosopher, the psychologist, the psychologist, the scientist see consciousness differently and in amongst, and it's so complicated. The extent of human knowledge is so huge. I mean, just in science, you've got botany, you've got zoology, you've got paleontology, you've got evolutionary biology, you've got physics, you've got mathematics. Everything's become so specialized in science that we don't understand each other. It's like we know more and more about less and less, as some people say. And, you know, even as a scientist, you know, I find it really quite hard to understand other, other areas of science. And I think that's very sad. And I think scientists should be educated always to be able to talk about what they do in lay terms. I mean, they tend to use these uh, acronyms and loads and loads of words that that complicate ologies and ogenies and all sorts of things that make the whole thing very complicated. And I think we've got to somehow find a way for all these scientists to talk to each other. So one way to start with what we mean by consciousness is to just ask oneself, what do I think of consciousness? Is your view of consciousness confined to human, the human brain, or is it per pervasive throughout existence, so-called panpsychism? For example, do you think that you have consciousness personally or does consciousness have you or both? And, you know, I think in order to know that both are true, it's depending on where you're looking from. Um, and if you're able to embrace the paradox, then there never be, can be, there, there doesn't need to be any arguments about whether we're talking about my consciousness or pervasive um, consciousness of the whole. We just have to be clear what we're talking about because both are true. And so today we're interested in how does consciousness relate to material existence in evolution? Max Planck's statement. And I'm going to take a very scientific and materialist approach to the study of consciousness and evolution based on interconnectedness. And if I behind, I can't see behind the picture, I think it's its service. And I'm going to end up showing that's really based on, on love. I know that sounds way out right now, but you'll understand at the end. And I'm examining it in, in this way, I'm going to show that matter is derivative from consciousness, as Max Planck's statement says. And this, um, uh, this interconnectedness and service gives belonging and meaning and purpose to everything that exists. So that's where we're heading. So now I've got to start with a definite definition of consciousness for my, my, uh, for my investigation. So I've already said experientially, personally, I experience I have consciousness and also consciousness has me. If I'm involved with the survival of my ego or my physical body, um, just in ordinary daily activities, I'm, I have consciousness. But like when I go for a walk, I went for a walk earlier today in the woods and I'm it was a sunlight was coming through the trees and the birds were singing and the squirrels were playing and and I in, in that sort of situation when I'm just enjoying being part at one with my surroundings and and loving belonging 
to the trees and the sunlight and the birds and squirrels, then I've got a feeling of belonging that consciousness has me. So as I said, uh, both are true for me, depending on where I'm coming from. The dictionary definition, the Cambridge Dictionary, says it's a state of understanding and realising something. And immediate, I think, oh, where's that going? That understanding and realising, that sounds very human brain-like. Um, I don't like that much. I don't think that's going to take me anywhere with Max Planck's consciousness, uh, matter derivative from consciousness. Then the Oxford Dictionary says, the state of being aware of and responsive to surroundings. And from my experience of life, hands-on, as, you know, bench scientists working with life for 60 years, that's it. That's true of everything. Aware of and responsive to surroundings. From my experience, from my materials approach to my science at the bench, um, my, my director, I used to be called a scientific butterfly because I used to be doing all different, getting interested in all different things and changing field all over the place. But from a materialist approach, isn't everything aware of and responsive to surroundings? So what do I mean by that? Aware of and responsive to surroundings. Now, of course, we're aware of our surroundings, our, uh, surroundings, our senses, sight, sound, touch, smell, taste. And we're self-aware. Differently, We have thoughts, emotions, feelings, memories, our analytical mind, imagination, etc., and all other forms of life um, and non-life, they can be more like the human, but they can, be, they can be conscious to different extents and in different ways. So I would say a worm is aware of and responds to surroundings. If you tread on a worm, it wriggles and wants to get away. A bee is aware of and responds to surroundings. If you threaten his beehive, a warrior bee is going to bite you the frog and fish, everything is aware of and responsive to surroundings. They've got to know their food, find their food, know where they are, how to get home, etc., etc. Even a bacterium, um, you may not like the word aware, it might seem a bit human, but a bacterium detects or senses its environment. If there's some um, sugar at some distance, I used to work with this just for fun, then a bacterium detects the gradient of the sugar and swims up the gradient. It's got uh, uh, receptor molecules on the surface and sees the food and it can also see the gradient and measure it in time so that it swims to the food it's called chemotaxis and now I'm going to talk to you about my amoebae which I worked with for a couple of years as an example of I'm not going to say a lower form of life I hate this definition lower forms and higher forms of life but an amoeba is a simple form of life that does such amazing tricks in its life, uh, in its life cycle. So here's some amoeba. I work with slime mold amoeba. I went to a lecture in Edinburgh by Bonner, and he uh, talked about how these amoeba, they live on rotting vegetation in the soil, gobbling up bacteria and things. And when they run out of food and they get very dense like they are here, they form they come together and make a multicellular structure called a slug. And when I when Bonner gave the lecture, they didn't, it was not known how they did this. And I thought that was just absolutely fascinating. How did they, all these amoebae know? They know they've run out of food. And they form this slug in order to migrate to new pastures where they might find more food. And I just thought, God, that's so clever. So I started working with amoebae. I, I'd, I'd feed them lots of bacteria, then I'd wash all the bacteria away. Then I just spend, I used to spend days in the lab just watching them and trying to catch them and see how they formed the slug. And somehow I couldn't, it was all chaotic and uh, disorganized, but suddenly there was a slug and I couldn't really work it out. And so one day I thought, maybe I'm not watching them, you know, long enough. And so I took the plates home and um, I got a microscope at home in, Ed had in Edinburgh, this was, and I just kept watching them. And again, we, I wasn't getting anywhere, so I got tired and I put them in our fridge. And this is an example of serendipity in science. We had this dreadful fridge in Edinburgh that had a temperature of about eight or 10 degrees. It didn't really get very cold. And when I got up in the morning and went to the fridge, I found, oh, what have I done? these incredible patterns. So I had never seen these patterns before. 
I think people working with slime molds saw them periodically, but somehow putting the plates in the fridge for a few hours at eight degrees slowed down something. I mean, maybe we'll be living at ambient temperature. They'd be cold in winter, they'll be warmer in summer and so on. Who knows what temperature they particularly like. But something about putting them in the fridge um, serendipitously enabled me to get these really regular patterns of these amoebae that were um, aggregating towards the center to form a multicellular structure, sometimes in a wonderful spiral. So once we had these patterns, we could actually analyze how they formed under the microscope and also with time-lapse cinematography. We were able, and as they come together each other in these, they're forming these spirals, and as they get closer, they start getting dense in these uh, patches here and migrating towards each other and form these wonderful streams of amoebae and the whole thing spiraling like a galaxy. So with our time lapse we could see that those bands of those white bands and those these were bands of amoebae moving inwards. You can actually see in this one because they're very dense here you can see that these amoebae are sort of elongated because they're moving towards a source. And these ones are rounded up because they're in a refractory period. Because what happens is that when they starve and their, their metabolome inside the cells know they're starving, things change and it triggers a gene to emit a pulse of cyclic chemical, cyclic AMP. So it's pulsing cyclic AMP and that's diffusing out. And amoebae in an above threshold concentration detect the cyclic AMP was receptors on their surface and they respond by, you know, chemotaxis like the bacteria moving towards the source and then they emit their own signal and that goes further out and that brings these amoebae further out into the, in the territory, into the center. So the signal, this is pulsing, the signal's relayed out and bands of amoebae are moving in. And when they get to the center and they they pile up here and then they form this slug. And the reason they form this multicellular structure is because the amoebae can only move through micrometers where this big slug with thousands of amoebae in it can move through centimeters. And, and once it's formed, it differentiates its round along its length and it has amoebae in the tip here. These cells develop receptors that can detect light, phototactic, and they can detect heat, thermotactic, so that the tip of the slug is detecting where the light and the heat's coming from. And so cleverly, it's telling the slug to go to the soil surface. And while it's migrating to the soil surface, it's already getting ready for what it's going to do there, because all the amoebae in the front third here are getting ready, they're diff starting to differentiate and getting ready to make a stalk. And these ones are getting ready to make spore, okay? front third developed stalk back to third so that when it gets to the surface the slug due to evaporation of ammonia makes a sort of uh, uh, ball, ball of uh, cells and then those cells that were going to make stalk sacrifice their lives to bear the ones that were going to make spores on top of the stalk and the reason they're on top of the stalk is that a passing hikers boot or a mouse or something can pick up the spores and take them to new pastures. So this was a landmark paper that we published in 1974. It's just been quoted again this month by people working with spiral, spiraling patterns. And we were able by looking in the microscope and making time-lapse films that were such fun, we were able to work out all the parameters, the periodicity of the pulse, the speed that the signal was relayed out, the movement step, how far they moved, uh, the refractory period when they were emitting signal to go further out and so on. So we published all the parameters in uh, 1974. And then I had to move to another field. Now, when materialist science looks the mechanisms, and the reason I told you about my amoebae, because you could see how these amoebae, through their life cycle, how they've got receptors on the surface, they're sensing change, they signal each other, they, 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 they can detect heat and light and, and they can go to the surface, make a fruiting body. And it's just, you know, it's just, when I, I've put lower life forms, I don't know why I do that, I suppose because that's 
why what the we say lower forms and i just think they're so clever <laughs> i think they're tremendously clever now higher life forms like us in a way we sense changes we sense changes in their environment aware of and responsive to changes in the environment by similar mechanisms with our senses we have special cells that can detect smells and light uh, light waves uh, and and sound and touch we have special cells that have receptors that detect all these signals from the environment and these cells then sent they, they receive the signal and send it to the brain. And indeed, uh, this just a couple of months ago, um, there were two scientists got the Nobel Prize for identifying um, specific cells in skin that have receptors that can differentiate between whether your skin's being scratched or stroked. So in a way, we're, 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 doing, we're sensing the change with, with the cell, specific cells that are made that have differentiated to sense change through receptors on their surfaces, sending signals to the brain. And then of course, once we get into the brain area, we get into all the complications of the heart problem and all that, but we're not dealing with that today. So in a way, throughout all of the tree of life, whether we're talking about animals or plants, we're seeing consciousness in a terms of the Oxford dictionary definition aware of, if you like, detect and response. And the, the mechanisms are scientifically material and they're understood. We know the mechanisms, okay? So there's no mystery there. Well, maybe there's a mystery about the hard problem, but I, I mean, I have, a pro I have a problem with the hard problem. And populations have consciousness at the level of the whole population. We'll have a look at these in a minute. And what about non-life? Atoms, molecules, ecosystems, planets, solar systems, they all detect change in environment and respond according to this Oxford Dictionary definition. A rock that's got its vibrating atoms inside and its whole energy will be different if it's sitting in a load of ice or in, an, in extreme heat. So the, a rock is, in my opinion, is aware of and responsive. So I'm proposing that the mechanisms at all levels, the scientific, the material mechanisms at all levels of complexity in my hierarchy are going to depend on interconnectedness that's going to provide the awareness of the parts serving their higher order structure. So let's develop that. We're going to develop a hierarchy of conscious atom to cosmos based on this Oxford dictionary definition that applies to everything. But I'm going to see awareness as interconnectedness. If aware is too much a human term, think of detecting or sensing, sentient. If uh, responsiveness is going to be service, if service is a human term, just think that the parts have to respond uh, to, to their environment by support, by behaving in a way to support survival. So that's the service of the parts to the whole. Now, interconnectedness, what is interconnectedness? Here are four things, right? If they were just sitting out there on their own, they wouldn't mean much. But if they're interconnected with all these strings, they, they create a greater whole. So that once these parts are connected by all these strings, they're going to detect any change in any part of the system and the whole will respond. So a tug on any one of these strings is going to change everything. And so this interconnectedness, whereas these parts were just wandering around um, whatever they were doing, their interconnectedness gives them belonging and meaning because now they belong to a whole due to their interconnectedness. If one could ask, if, uh, you know, when I could ask myself, would I exist without interconnectedness? I've been feeling a bit of that with um, solitary confinement recently, uh, with lockdown. I mean, with every, with all my connectedness, with people and things that I do and my environment and traveling about, it, it, one gets, starts to get the feeling that, you know, you, you lose, you disconnect, you lose this sense of meaning, belonging, and purpose. So that's what's happening to a lot of people now uh, in a very bad way. Now, in order to, if I was going to look at my hierarchy, I, I had to try to find some sort of model. I'm always like, I like models. So I made this model here. Now, this is actually an ancestry model turned upside down. So this is me with two parents, four grandparents, eight grandparents, 
great grandparents and so on. I've just turned it upside down. So I'm calling this layer atoms. These are molecules. These are cells. Then they make the tissues and, and the tissues make the organs and the organs make the life forms and the life forms go into populations or communities. And then this is a bit of a hiccup, but I didn't know how to change the diagram. But I put the populations into ecosystems. The ecosystems come together to make planet. Planets come together to make solar systems, galaxies and cosmos. So this is just a model of increasing complexity with at each level, the parts serving a high order structure here. So this is not numerical. Obviously, there's more than two atoms making a molecule. There's 3000 molecules in a cell. It's not numerical. It's merely a diet and it's not implying any superior place up here. You could turn it all down, all upside down, have atom up here, the cosmos down here with extinction. And I just don't know whether one can make a model of non-life based on the same sort of parts coming together to make a greater whole. Um, a geologist might have to do that, but I'm going to bring in non-life when I put my populations into ecosystems. So this is diagrams only showing interconnectedness. Now, there's, I, as I kept started thinking about this progress of increasing complexity and evolution, uh, some rules emerged, and I'm going to give you the rules now so that you're ready for them and you can be there, you can be ready for when they appear. These are the rules of my model of hierarchy of interconnectedness. Everything is in service to a higher order structure. At each level, the parts detect and respond to the environment and the material mechanisms are known, okay, scientifically. The, the service of the parts to their high order structure is essential for their survival in evolution. But I forgot to put, point this out previously with my tree of life, that evolution's not going anywhere, it's turnover, that extinction equals creation, okay? Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. It's turnover. New <coughs> things appear and species die. New appear then die. So it's turnover. So the service of parts to their higher order structure is essential for survival, but that's not an imperative in this model because extinction equals creation. The parts do not, not, do not know what they're serving, but at each level, the whole is looking after its parts. Now, what that means is that an atom is more stable than a molecule. A molecule is more stable in a cell. Cells are more viable and stable in a tissue than they are alone. So at every level, the high order structure is looking after its parts so that they're more, more stable, they survive better. Maybe one could think safety in numbers. So at every point, it's a conglomeration of parts to greater whole, conglomeration to greater whole with increased uh, uh, survival potential. So now I've put some pictures in. So here are my atoms and here are my molecules and some cells. I didn't have, have enough nodes to, to put them all in. So I've, I've put the tissues in with the organs and then we've got life forms. And now this is a tree of life, all animals and plants, all fauna and flora. And I've put a mouse there so you won't be thinking about human brains. And then you've got the life forms making communities. Uh, interconnected communities for greater survival. Um, and they're gonna, then I'm gonna put the populations in ecosystem planets and so on. So now what we, and one I'm introducing here also flux, reverberation, any interconnected structure. And I'll give an example of, in terms of finance later on. You, it, it, everything knows about everything else because every single thing is connected to every other thing. And, but it can move around so that you could have top down or bottom up or middle out. And there can be changes in the connectivity, which may become important later when I talk about a little bit about paranormal. So where are we going from here? So now what I'm gonna do is just remind you that we know the material mechanisms, the science, we know the science of all this. So I'm not bringing in the non-material, which Galileo is so, keen about non-material, that'll come in at the end. 
we're not going to get a bit lost with that because. Uh, so we start with an atom. This is a carb this is a carbon atom. It's got six positive protons, six neutral neutrons, and six negatively charged electrons, all in their proper orbits. And everything, all these things are serving the atom, and the atom's fine, but it can be really unbalanced if we alter the part. So if we put in some more neutrons than should be there, then we get radioisotopes, which are which are various, which happen with various atoms, which are prone to radioactive decay. So if doesn't, if parts aren't behaving themselves, the atom can die. Then atoms join hands and become more stable. So this is a molecule of caffeine. It's got eight carbons, black ones, 10 nitrogens, blue ones, uh, 10 hydrogens, blue ones, four nitrogens, the white ones, and a couple of oxygens, the red ones. And what they're doing, they're, sharing electrons in their outer orbits with, to form covalent bonds. And they like to do that because it makes them more stable, the atoms. So those, those, these little bars of the covalent bonds representing the covalent bonds where they're sharing electrons in their outer orbits. So then, so we've got atoms have gone to molecules and we have molecules gone going into cells, okay? The next level of complexity. Now, a cell, a human cell, um, you've got 3,000 biochemical pathways all interconnected in every cell. So all these biochemical pathways connected in every cell. And like I showed you with the model of interconnectedness, if you change all these pathways, are governed by an enzyme acting on a, a substrate to create a product, and that product could be the substrate of another enzyme, and so on. they're all interconnected, these biochemical pathways. And... Um, as I showed you with interconnectedness, if you change any pathway, it affects all these pathways. It's called metabolic flux. And like I learned about epigenetics from Waddington in the 60s uh, in Edinburgh, I also learned about metabolic flux from Henny Catcher in the 60s. So interconnectedness um, uh, and cells responding to environment something very early in my training as a scientist. And so if you change anything, it's called metabolic flux it, and when responding to the environment. So this is your metabolome. Now, if you wanted to see how things change, you think, oh my goodness, how do you look at 3000 biochemical pathway? Mm -hmm. But there are certain key players in this whole system that you look at specifically to know what your cell is doing, a bit like government whips. And so you can identify a starvation metabolome, a drug addiction metabolome, a, a sugar eating metabolome, so you can identify the different types of metabolome by study of the key players. So here we have interconnected molecules within a cell. The molecules are serving the cell and the cells looking after the molecules. Then, then cells go to tissues. So as you know, all cells in the body have the same 20,000 genes. Um, in mammals, let's say, but this is like a human embryo can look exactly the same as a rat embryo, but they develop very differently because well, you, you've got about 100 different cell types. You've got the same genes in every cell, but during embryonic and fetal development, the cells are told what to do by the environment they find themselves in. And, and they're told what to do, how to program their genes on, off, up and down in order to have a specific function. And they're told this by the environment. It's like the environment's in charge. And their genes are epigenetically programmed due to their different local environments way back, not at this stage, but way back during early development. So if cells found themselves in a part of a fetus that was making bone, they would turn off all the genes for the other skill times. They'd turn off muscle and nerve and skin and all of that. And they'd just make, use the genes to make bone. Or if they found themselves like in the yolk sac, when you get the stem cells for hemopoietic stem cells making blood in the early fetus, and they find themselves in these little niches in the yolk sac, they get the message from the environment to program their genes just to make blood and muscle and so on and so on. So all cells have the same genes, but the cells 
mod uh, program the gene expression differently according to the environment they find themselves in during development in the different local environments. I mean, they all have housekeeping genes that's concerned with growth and division and so on. And those, those housekeeping genes are always on in all cells. But then the tissue specific genes uh, are on or off according to how they're uh, told what to do by their environment. And then of course your tissues come together to make organs, right? That's the next level, the heart, your liver and your stomach and kidneys and so on. So we've got from cells making tissues, tissues to organs, and then your organs uh, obviously create you. And that's one of the rules, remember? So, I mean, your heart, liver, your digestive system, they don't know about you, but they all function to serve you. But you, as their high order structure, look after them, you look after the organs. So where are we? We've got, we've got to life forms, I think. Now we're going to put the life forms into a community or populations. And this is wonderful to see in flocks of birds and shoals of fish. And in humans, these are supporters of a, of a, of a soccer team. Now, I don't know, somebody probably knows how flocks of birds come together, but it's important for their survival because when they're migrating, you don't want any of the birds getting lost. So they form this high order structure called a flock. And shoals of fish, they form this higher order structure called a shoal in order to protect most of them from the predator. They all huddle together. So the fish find it difficult to eat all of them. And here you've got all these supporters are raising one arm for some reason. And this lot are all raising two arms. And these poor, these, are, these girls are obviously supporters of the other team that didn't get the goal. But we all do the same thing. When they don't get the goal, everybody goes like this. And when they do get the goal, everybody goes like this. So I don't know, but we do know about bees. So when we have a population of bees, the bees are supporting their high order structure. They don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. And the way they support it is these bees, the nurse, the forager, the farmer, the warrior, <laughs> they all have the same genes, but their genes are programmed differently so that they behave differently. So the nurse bees look after the eggs and things and the foragers go out and get food and the farmers and the warriors keep you from so on. And interestingly, so they're epigenetically programmed to make them do these different jobs. Now, the interesting thing is epigenetic program is heritable in the same way that genes are heritable, but it can be changed, uh, which was part of my work on deprogramming into stem cells. We're wiping out all the, epigenetic modifications to create embryonic stem cells, which happens um, in the first, after the first week of development in, in mammals. Um, you go back to what's called tabula rasa, all systems go, totipotent. You can actually deprogram de the genes of a nurse bee and have it reprogrammed into forage bee. I mean, I don't know how that happens, but it is known. And you could have a mutation in bees called anarchic. And this is very interesting in terms of humans. If you have the anarchic bees, they're, they're mm -hmm. real loafers. They just sit around on a flower and do nothing. And if you've got too many anarchic bees in the beehive, the beehive dies. And when the beehive dies, so do all the bees. So the high order structure is looking after the parts of the beehive. The bees are serving the beehive. The beehive's looking after the bees. And this is true of all, of all populations, communities, tribes, herds, prides, and so on. And the Portuguese have bought jellyfish, which also the jellyfish differentiate into different parts that have different ways of serving. As we differentiate into different parts and we have different roles and we serve the community by the role we take on. And the role we take on also is programming us in the way we behave and the uniform we wear and so on. Now we have to go from communities and put the communities into ecosystems. Now an ecosystem, and this is, as I said, is a bit of a problem for my diagram because it seems a bit of a hiccup to go from life to non-life and I <coughs> worked out how to do that diagrammatically. But what is an ecosystem? 
An ecosystem is a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. So we're bringing in non-life. The parts are interconnected in service to the whole for survival. So you've got a forest and an ocean and a river and different sorts of foliage and your predator and the prey and this whole ecosystem is looking after itself. And as we know very clearly now, if you remove the forest, like in the Amazon, the ecosystem will die. If you divert the river and send the river off to somewhere else, the ecosystem will die. And interestingly, a wonderful example is Yellowstone Park in America, where they decided to take out the wolves and they killed a lot of the wolves, which meant that these herb, these uh, plant herb eating animals multiplied like crazy and they ate up all the herbs alongside the ponds and lakes and things, which then all dried up and the Yellowstone ecosystem started to die. So they had to put the wolves back. One can map a whole continent with types of different ecosystems and how they work. You can map the whole earth with ecosystems. But if you just try, so, okay, so the whole earth then, so if we're going from the ecosystem, putting them together to make our planet earth. So putting the ecosystems, the next order of complexity is the solar system. So this is rightly compared with an atom because you've got all these planets and their orbits around the nucleus, which is the sun. And everything's got to behave itself for things to survive. And we know from the past that our earth has been severely threatened with a meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs that Jupiter should have jolly well diverted that the massive uh, gravitational pull of meteor, uh, gravitational pull of Jupiter, we would hope would attract a meteor from further out, but it didn't. And we also had an ice age. And I, I, don't, I don't know how the ice age happened. And we've got to have our sun behaving itself because our sun emits these coronal mass ejections every now and then. And interestingly, just a couple of years ago, when I was thinking about all this, some astronomers spotted a distant star, a star is the sun, spitting out a giant flare that packed 100,000 times more energy than anything seen from Earth's sun. So they, they saw the first clear detection of a remote star or sun emitting a kind of eruption that we know from our sun as coronal mass ejection. Um, and they, they're seen from our sun. But such explosions, if our sun, if, we, if it did a coronal mass injection of that sort of energy, uh, that would be wreck havoc on surrounding the world. So we really require that our sun behaves itself. But of course, now the major threat to our planet now is climate change. And interestingly, with the melting of the ice caps in the Arctic and Antarctic, um, it's changed the distribution of weight in the planet. So it was already it's already tilted on its axis, but it's changed that tilt by, I, don't, I can't remember how many degrees, but that's sort of quite scary. We could go flying off into space or something. I don't know what to imagine. So, right, that's it. We've got to galaxies and into cosmos and, and then what? So when, can you draw a line at the top? I mean, we don't know what's beyond cosmos, but makes you wonder whether it stops there, something we don't know about. So now I'm going to go from the material science, which I've argued is known, the mechanisms in material science are known throughout all this increase in complexity. And don't forget that it also goes back in the other direction of the cosmos to atoms. So now in terms of a hierarchy of interconnectedness of parts in service to their higher order structure throughout. But as I said, with an interconnected structure, everything is, everything knows about everything. Everything is connected to everything else. But because of flux, a possible movement, those connections could become detectable. For instance, with non-locality, it could be a possible and telepathy. But if the connections go across several levels of complexity, it, it won't look material because the material mechanisms are different in all these interconnected lines. So we wouldn't be able to see how it worked in space. 
Then what about telepathy, which is more connections made in time? It would also look non-material in time. But it's like other connections made due to flux. You know, I don't mean that things are actually moving. But given that everything's connected to everything else, it, one wonders if it's a possibility. And it, one wonders if connections made could be recorded so that it, so there could be remembering. So that information could come back in formation, as it were. And, and I know I'm, I'm sort of bringing in entanglement here, which I know nothing about. But I'm saying that it's interesting to think how the paranormal would operate in an inter interconnected hull of everything that exists. For instance, here is like a diagram I found in a Wikipedia search of the financial interconnections across the planet and showing how that flux bringing different parts of the green with the red to the black in proximity with each other, they could actually calculate what could be risky connections and, and how, how different connections could affect the transfer of all this finance around the world. So in summary then, this is a hierarchy of uh, from atom to cosmos of consciousness. Based on the Oxford Dictionary definition, which some people won't agree with, and, but I'm giving, I've formed another de definition, my own definition, because I'm saying that aware is interconnectedness, as I showed you at the beginning, the parts connected by the strings, the connections create the awareness. And the responsive I've shown as service here, service to the higher order structure. Everything's got to behave itself or else it won't survive. But remember, survival is not an imperative because extinction equals creation. Now, I think I've shown that what Max Planck was saying, that matter is derivative from consciousness, that all these levels of increasing complexity are derived from interconnectedness and service based on aware and responsive. So I hope that that's what I set out to do, is to show matter is derivative from consciousness. Now, in terms of the non-material, these lines of connection are non-material. I call them the in-between of things, okay? I think of, say, in-between of things, like I love my dog, my dog loves me, where it's love. It's not with the dog, it's not with me, it's between us. And it doesn't exist. Now, the lines of connection the in-betweens of things in these parts serving the whole had to be unconditional service. They couldn't go off and do their own thing. They had to do it the way it had to be done. I mean, it's like the anarchic bees. The bee can't just do its own thing. But unconditional service is what we think of as love. And in fact, it's interesting to know that unconditional service, such as, um, oh, voluntary work activates the pleasure centers of the brain in the human. Unconditional service activates pleasure centers in the brain. It makes you happy. So it's an evolutionary selectable. And so I like to think that these lines, what binds it all together is the greatest power in the universe as love which is non-material, it's an in-between of things, it's these connecting lines. I'm going way out here, I realize, but that's how I like to think of it. So in summary then, I've given you a hierarchy based on wanting to know what Max Planck meant, the matter was derivative from consciousness. I've shown you a hierarchy of consciousness to atom to cosmos, and each level of complexity, the parts, are aware, they sense or detect their surroundings. And if the, and if the surroundings change, they respond so as to help their higher order structures survive. And the mechanisms, the point is about, you know, the Galileo and what we say, these words, non-material science. I mean, I find it very difficult to put those non-material 
together with the word science. That certainly I've shown you totally um, reductionist, well, materialistic science mechanisms at each level. The paths respond in service to their high order structure. The high order structure is looking after its parts. It's helping them to survive better. And as I said, from my original way I connected those things to make, a, make them belong to a whole, it, the, the interconnectedness gives belonging and it gives meaning and gives pur purpose to everything in existence. The service is survival, survival is not imperative. The new has to replace the old. There's no more matter coming into our universe. It, the amount of matter we have was just one big bang 14 billion years ago. There's no more. So what's happening is we're, we're new is replacing the old, there's turnover. And this is just a law in existence that death has to equal birth, that extinction has to equal creation. So, you know, some people might be disappointed that there's no purpose, no noosphere in uh, Tayyad. I tried to read Tayyad de Shadda again. I remember being so impressed with him like 60 years ago, but trying to read Tayyad de Shadda again, it doesn't make sense to me anymore. I have to say that Richard Dawkins makes more sense to me than Tayyad now. But anyway, new is replacing the old, death equals birth, extinction equals great, the interconnected lines, the unconditional service, which I can see as love. And I'm just suggesting that my so-called mechanistic reductionist and materialist approach as a scientist, um, I've ended up, I think, proving that God is love, but we'll see what everybody else thinks. Thank you. Marilyn, thanks so much. <clears throat> a fantastic uh, overview and presentation. I love the way you brought in the different phases of your work um, as well. Could you um, stop your screen share and then we can go into, then we can see each other a bit. I've got a quickly. nice poem. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, that's not it. That's just giving the millions of years ago, these nodes of departure of the different species worked out by sequencing. I don't need to share this poem, it's gone. No, I like this. Do you want to read that? This body is not me. I'm not caught in this body. I am life without boundaries. I've never been born. Look at the, never die. Look at the ocean, which I love to do. Look at the sky filled with stars, which I love to do. Look at my ancestors, my descendants, all manifestations, this wondrous mind. I don't like the word mind. It's too human. Since before time, I have been free. Birth and death are only doors, sacred threshold on our journey. Birth and death, but just a game. Leela, a game of hide and seek. We're here on holiday. So smile with me, take my hand, say goodbye, goodbye to a meet again. I don't know why I think that's, that's not terribly relevant to my... Um, Who's it by? Ah? Uh? Who's it by? Don't remember. The poem. Don't remember. Okay, well, it puts it in a different form. Um, so... Uh, oh, hang on, I've tried to... I have stopped share, have you I? Have. You have stopped sharing. I'm just going to put it back on speaker view. Uh, and we have some people very quick off the mark. And it's Angus who's on um, out of the blocks first. Oh, hi, hi, Angus. Angus is... Hi, Marilyn. Hi. We've communicated, yeah. We um, well, that, thank you very much. Really interesting thoughts about the links between connectedness, perhaps what the physicists might call interaction. The biologist connectedness um but i think it's probably the same thing um and consciousness and love and the, there's certainly some very deep relationship isn't there between all those things whether they're exactly the same i'm not sure um so just a couple of points um the first point um about a definition and there were two halves to your definition wasn't wasn't there of consciousness there was awareness and responsiveness it's not mine, now, it's Oxford. Oxford. Yeah, the Oxford, yeah, yeah, the one you used. Um, and uh, responsiveness is we, we're all agreed on. The problem about awareness is that no, none of us actually know anything about anyone else's or whether anything else is aware. 
Uh, we only know our own awareness. We presume that each other are aware, are aware. but when it gets down to sort of amoeba, uh, or when it gets down to, there's actually a paper called "What is What is It Like to Be a Quark," which is sort of based on loosely based on uh, Thomas Nagel's paper "What Is It Like to Be a Bat," which gets across this problem. The so the quarky, problem is quarky and yeah, becky. Yeah. <laughs> So the problem is that uh, this is why we find it very difficult to define consciousness because everything else, it, we can't define it in terms of everything else. Everything else is defined within consciousness. It's, it's very, very, very fundamental. Um, but I, so that we end up just using the other definitions that one uses are just other words like experience or awareness. Uh, um, and Thomas Nagel in the paper I've just mentioned, the 1974 paper, what is it like to be a bat? He used the the idea he didn't quite define it, but he said, if it is like something to be a creature, uh, then that creature is consciousness. It is conscious. Anyway, so I think there's just a slight issue there. Um, I think that in order to establish your, your um, hypothesis, which is that matter is derivative from consciousness, which I actually agree with, I think you have to go down into quantum physics. And once you go into, and, and probably also uh, relativistic physics, once you go into quantum physics, you suddenly start to find that things like electrons and photons and quarks, they don't have solidity. They don't have definite position. They don't have definite radii size, in other words. They don't have def definite location. So, and, and the, all those, those properties I've mentioned are emergent from the quantum level on the macro level. And so that, I think, may be the missing link, that actually the quantum level may all be informational. And there's a number of physicists, there's three groups of physicists. There's the Stephen Wolfram's uh, computational universe, which George Deutsch has got another variant of called constructor theory. Um, there is Max Tegmark's um, mathematical consciousness, uh, sorry, mathematical universe. And there is uh, Wheeler's it from bit, everything is information. So that, that was, that's my comment. And I think that's the missing link uh, in your talk, but it was brilliant and very interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Angus. I, I don't see a problem um, with not fully knowing what it's like to be my dog or my horse, <laughs> but I do know that they're aware and respond to the environment in a very similar way that I do. So, I mean, I just find that academic, I mean, obviously um, not my field as an academic consciousness, but it just seems terribly complicated to me. I mean, I can't really understand the hard problem. You know, people say, what's it like to see red? That's not a bother for me. I mean, I may have told my kids that that wavelength or that they felt from the letterbox was red. Then anything, then whenever they see the same color as the letterbox, they say red. I just can't see it somehow. I've got a real just block. coming back on that. Um, I mean, I think well, we need to. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, we do need to move on because we've got quite a few people in the queue. If you don't mind, uh, Angus, we've thanks, only got thanks, 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 thanks. minutes. Um, I actually want to ask, this is Clint Norton from the chat, then we'll go on to uh, Tuvi. Um, if you didn't interpret connections as love and cooperative components as in service, how, you, how would you describe these relationships? Me? Yes. Which well, relationship? Well, that, that, that if you didn't interpret connections as love and cooperative components as in service, how would you describe them? In other words, is there a different language which you could use then um, which would be equivalent but, but structurally equivalent if you like i mean the thing is those are the ones you've chosen so that you may not be able to answer the question i'm very sorry i'm not understanding the question well it's 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 what alternative terms could you use well that's what i've said before i've asked you what can i say the in-between of things sounds a little bit clumsy but I haven't found another way of saying it the in-between of things as the example I give I love my dog my dog love my dog loves me the love's in between us and we take care of each other 
Um, okay, I think we'll we'll move on from that. Um, so, Tuvi. Marilyn, first of all, I want to tell you that it was wonderful, okay? I heard you many times, but I just want to tell you wonderful combination, both for the science behind this and the love. So it was wonderful, just to let you know. Perfect, okay? That's first of all, okay? And I really mean it, and thank you very much for this. I think uh, also it's very nice to see how you yourself uh, develop yourself in the last few years from criticized consciousness to really try to go inside to this. So just compliment you, first of all. But there is only one point that I want to mention that I think that we should work maybe together on this. I'd be happy to work with you. Because until now, you describe all the evolution. You can see the beautiful in, the, in all these creations. But there is such wisdom in all this universe, such wisdom, beauty, and love, that it's not just random. There is something behind this, and that's the point that I want to mention. There is purpose behind all this. And this is a point that I'm sure that you can have to continue to work. I'm happy to work together with you, because all this is not just random. You can see such beautiful work together in every cell and in all this complexity. And you can see also the evolution and also how life creating, it's not, it can be random. So there is consciousness which creates all this for a purpose. And this is a point that I want to mention that we have to add to this also so purpose. So it's not just random things, there is purpose behind this and the evolution is part of this purpose. And not just the evolution of life, you know, that you can see animals uh, more complicated, but also in all this universe, there is consciousness which develop and more level of consciousness. But this is just a comment that I'm sure that I'll, I'll be delighted to work with you on this, okay? And thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Tuvi. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Tuvi. Um, Sarah. So I also want to say thank you, Marilyn. I loved your your whole explanation of the way the amoebae work. <laughs> and I also like the fact, I really am fascinated by I love that them. paper. <laughs> um, and also I like the fact that you dealt with how the Oxford Dictionary defines consciousness. I mean, you said, okay, this is what it is. And, it, and as you said, the awareness is at every level. Um, I'm also, along with um, Angus, thinking that there might be a complementary way to look at this that sort of broadens it. It doesn't disagree with it, it just broadens it. And that is also from quantum theory. So your theory builds the whole from the parts, whereas quantum theory would start with a whole and go to the parts. So if we look at the biology, morphogenetic fields is a good example. The, the, the examples that have been used is the DNA is like the building blocks and the, the biophysical fields, the electromagnetic fields and the other fields are like, or the morphogenetic fields are like the architectural plan. So the person who's working with that now at Tufts University is um, Michael Levin. And he's actually stopped these fields from growing at, at the embryonic level. And he shows that the embryo won't develop. So there, the, the, the wave particle duality is actually visibly, experimentally demonstrable in, in embryonic development. But if you look at a larger level, the whole issue of entanglement, um, that's where the telepathy comes in because you take say two photons or electrons and you, you know, send them how many miles in the opposite direction. One always knows what the other one is doing because the connectedness is primary, not secondary. So these are just thoughts, but I really enjoyed your talk. So thank you. And if, if you could send me the paper on the amoeba, I'd love to see it. Oh, yeah, I really okay. would. Thank, thank you. you. So I'll, I'll try to remember, yeah. Thanks very much, Sarah. That, that Michael Levin work is absolutely fascinating. And, and um, Paul Kinovitz um, wrote an article a couple of, two or three years ago um, on exactly that. Uh, right, Jane, I, I think you want to know about experience. I don't know whether you can, yes, here you are. Um, sorry, I'm, uh, can you unmute? Yeah. I'm unmute. Um, my question now then, you mentioned um, mystical experience and um, I'm quite interested in researching that and I wondered if you would say something about the mystical experiences that you said you had and what they meant to you, their meaning. Oh my gosh. Just one, maybe. Well, I suppose the one, well, a life review. I had one life review when I was in a car going over cliff as a teenager. 
and that I, I mean, the thing about mystical experiences is that they're hugely powerful. You never forget them. And you have just had one in a lifetime. You know, I'll never forget that life review. It said, like, if all that information was available in a flash, it, it must be out there. But to have it come in no time was just amazing. And then the other thing that I'm very peculiar about is people that I've loved and been close to as friends. Uh, they, they come to me either in an early morning dream or sudden pink light in a room or a sudden suddenly starting to cry when they're dying. And I don't know that they're dying. And in seven cases, I've responded by phoning, writing a letter across the planet, you know, from Cambridge to Melbourne or Melbourne to London. And those and the experiences of them coming into my life are heavenly experiences. You know, that they're, they're like being in heaven with them. Mm. And thank I you. Find them yes, thank you very amazing. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Sigma. Um, sorry, you need to unmute. Unmute. Good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're on. Good. Yes, Marilyn, thank you so much along my thinking and my presentation. And I don't know whether we met in Banyi when Harold presented the Galileo Commission project. So uh, now it's good to see you. I have a very practical question. You described bees, and I don't know whether you did some direct research. Has there been uh, a possibility that a warrior bee could become a nurse bee? Or is that only from the beginning of the original genetic code? No, I've never worked with bees and I don't know the things in detail. I would be able to look it up, but I gave it as an example of what I did discover and published in the 80s was the phenomenon of deprogramming in development, where all the programming of the genes the methylation of the cytosine basis on specific genes determining a program is completely removed. And that was a huge discovery. I know it was big discovery because nobody believed it for five years. Yeah. And now deprogramming by removing the epigenetic modifications, programming the genes is now very well known right. in all I mean, regenerative yeah. medicine and stem cells and so on. But when we discovered that um, it wasn't believed for five years. So yeah. you can be, we can be programmed. I mean, we've I mean, been programmed, but it can yeah. be wiped out. And we yeah. can I mean, program ourselves. I'm, doing, well. I'm yeah. doing light research and I'm a psychotherapist. So that's why I'm asking what we are doing is, as you know, from Ashoka, becoming a peaceful warrior that can nurse life. So, and but that comes through a process of not genetic reprogramming, but by becoming conscious. And with yeah. that, you well, throw the word love and God in. So now we have consciousness, God, and love that we need to define. Fortunately, you put a scientific question mark behind it. So, but in that respect, I can see for your work also from biology, I see love as a resonance with the flow of life. And in that moment where we are not resonant with the flow of life, there is not a state of being that we call love. Otherwise, we have an idea, romantic idea about love. But in that respect, we are a state of being. And that is, for me, the resonance with the flow of life and what you all described, all that we are in, the connectedness. All right. <laughs> I so very I, much like that. I thank, thank you, you very right. much. Wow. Wonderful. Well, oh, yeah. so and the capacity a... from, yeah. I'm trained in Alexander technique. Oh yeah. It's a system of self mastery and reprogramming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sigma. Um, and we're going on to Gail next. Yeah, thank you. That was delightful. And when you showed the slide of the, um, the isolation, the person in the desert, I couldn't help but be struck by the paradox. And it may be only paradoxical from a left brain sense of your describing the interconnections and the, the growing complexity of an organism and the consciousness infused in the interconnections and how things will die in isolation because they don't have that connection. And yet we have monks and we have desert dwellers from the early Christian contemplative um, 
tradition and uh, people who deliberately seek isolation uh, to connect like a direct line to this consciousness, love, God, whatever source. Um, and I just thought that was an interesting connection, you know, so-called paradox where it's an end run of around all the complexity when one organism isolates to connect directly to consciousness or the source of consciousness, um, allegedly. Um, or when we go into meditation very much alone uh, and we tap into something greater. I, I don't know what you, if you have any comment. No, that's, on what that. I, that's what I meant about the paradox of I have consciousness in terms of my ego and the survival of my physical being. But if I dissolve into the whole, then I disappear as an individual person. Consciousness then has me. That's what I meant by that. Mm -hmm. so I like that phrase. Thanks so much, Gail. Uh, we've got two more questions and then we're out of time. Um, so Peter, you're next. Thank you. <clears throat> I would like to know about your thoughts concerning the physical heart. And if you've had any uh, experience with that in terms of research and understanding in light of the latest heart transplant of a pig yeah. into a human being. Mm. And this relationship because I have um, a friend who had a heart transplant and his personality totally changed. And there are many stories about that. So at both sides of that question, how the heart itself could be a repository of consciousness. And then what will happen to this pig's heart <laughs> from your understanding of the interaction of the blood and everything going through it, what are those cells going to do? Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I mean, I, in my pigs, uh, I've got one of the highest sharing of genes with a human. And I read somewhere, I don't know if this is still thought to be true, but the reason why some religions won't eat pork is that, uh, you know, because pigs are so similar to humans, we, they, we, we're more likely to have this, catch their diseases and get the same diseases, which is why pork's prohibited. In some in some religions, um, but I don't know anything. I mean, people who do have transplants claim they have memories or some sense of the person that the organ came from, don't they? Yes. But I don't know. I don't know how the science of that. I, I, one could look it up, I suppose. Thanks. Yeah, a number of books have been written about it, but I haven't read anything for quite some time. The Change of Heart by uh, Claire Sylvia, for instance, and then Paul Pearsall wrote about it as well. Thanks very much, uh, Peter, very topical. And uh, Marjorie, co-chair, what's your question? Yes, my question has to do with the, well, first of all, I wanna say as a fellow scientist, I was enthralled with your entire presentation going from the very basics to the top. And it was beautiful for the intellect to watch how clearly um, it was all laid out so we could follow it beautifully. And, and also now as a fellow mystic, I'm wondering about this whole idea of moving back and forth between physical reality and this other side that we often call about the other side of the veil and what we may be learning um, when we add in the concept of reincarnation and how you would perhaps add that in to flesh out even further your particular concepts, or do you just want to leave it out because it doesn't quite fit with our beautiful material sense of what's going on? Well, it's you that I, that I, I you know, I agreed with in terms that, I mean, I don't know, but 10, the human brain is only operated 10% of its potential. And it's quite clear that we actually dampen all our senses. We only see what we want to see, hear what we want to hear. And I've you know, suggested before with wide angle vision or listening to the furthest off sound, huge amount more comes into the senses than we normally acknowledge. And I think you, you also suggested that, that physical death, when no signals are going down the spinal cord, the heart stopped beating, you've stopped breathing, it's known that the brain cells with all their connections will stay alive for a day or so. So the brain's still operating, but, but, it, but all signals that it normally receives from the body to tell it what it's about and what it's supposed to be doing have been removed. So it's not that 
it's like the body to brain signals have stopped, but the brain cells are still working, having lost all the dampening of the senses. So that individual brain becomes fully alive. That's the way I see it. And the experience of being fully alive, like it, that you can see in a baby's eye before it's dampened itself down in order to be more efficient or whatever, for whatever reason, we become so insensitive to our senses. You know, I just don't know whether the near-death experiences and all of that, you know, whether they're actually happening in the human brain. I mean, although the experience might be that you've jumped into a parallel universe existing of pure, vibrant energy, that might be that, but whether that's just your brain showing that, uh, that's not to lessen the experience, but it doesn't mean you've gone somewhere else. It means that your brain's become fully alive to every possibility, something like that. That's the way I sort of feel about it, but I don't Well, we're about to reincarnation. We can't have reincarnation. There's too many people already. Well, this obviously, this question, as, as Marjorie will know, needs to be seen within a much bigger research field because it's, it's not an isolated uh, no, phenomenon, isolated from other areas of consciousness studies. Um, I'm going to bring in Halle, who's unable to put his or her hand up, um, but has been wanting to ask a question. This will have to be the last one. Hi, I'm very sorry that I cannot actually turn my camera off. I just wanted to thank Marilyn for the magnificent presentation uh, that you just offered us. It was absolutely fantastic and uh, mind gobbling. I just wanted to reflect um, that um, the perspective that you actually from the perspective that you presented this this um, presentation was uh, from the very human point where language has the key point in explaining and describing different stages of consciousness yet the subject matter um, is actually about a lot a lot of other you know form of beings that are non-verbal so we certainly don't have that sense of reciprocating communication to uh, exactly understand what exactly the state of consciousness they are in um, and I just wanted to reflect on that that uh, there is um, a difference between two populations one which is verbal and have access to that um, way of describing things but the other one not and just wanted to reflect mm. on the world of language. Yes, yeah, any, yeah, any thank comments? You, thank you. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it does relate to um, Ian McGilchrist's hemisphere work in, the, the, in terms of the, the right and left and what is and isn't articulated. And I'm, at the moment, I'm actually trying to get through my review of volume one, 800 pages. So Marilyn, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, lots of appreciative comments in um, the chat. Um, the enormous clarity, scope, um, you've really stimulated a lot of thought um, in, <clears throat> um, uh, the, the, in everybody who's been here. And we'll, we'll, in the recording, we always send out a recording, um, we'll just send, we'll send links to um, these papers or any other papers you want to, to put in. And so a lot of people who haven't been able to attend, I had a few emails, will be able to hear you on the recording. And oh, so thank you. thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming and being part of this.